All right, welcome back to Down Under Football Crew, ladies and gentlemen. Really, really good to have you guys here on a uh, Monday evening if you're in uh, Australia or New Zealand and uh, obviously these parts where we are. Um, afternoon, uh, you could be in uh, Europe. Morning, I believe, in, in the States. I'm pretty sure it's probably morning over there. Um, so wherever you guys have tuned in, thank you so much for joining. Um, we have something interesting and a bit different uh, to talk about today. Not necessarily the weekend recap, which we may touch on a little bit in the midst of talking about this particular topic. But the topic is how managers become, I suppose, the centerpiece of most big clubs or just any sort of clubs where where the manager themselves are the are the most important part of the team and they have they have the capabilities of you know pulling out a victory out of nowhere or sensing a particular situation and changing that to change the identity of a match so it will be very very interesting to talk about obviously Thomas Tuchel masterclass against Spurs is something we'll definitely heavily talk about that many other managers this particular weekend and previously as well um, is, is going to be very interesting to talk about all of that. But before we get into everything, RJ, my man, how you doing? Oh, pleasure to be back, Miz, and talk with you fine gents and another crazy week in the English Premier League and just some broader leagues across Europe. Very excited about tonight's topic because while we like to sit back and watch the Warriors lock horns on their for their respective clubs, Equally interesting from my perspective is seeing the person on the dugout, the person running outside of their technical area, the one with the notepad, the one that coins the phrase winning starts on Monday. So it's the manager themselves. They, they're, they're the ones that get thrown under the bus when things go wrong, but equally they're at the heart and soul of when things go right. And, of course, we saw just how pivotal and influential a manager's wise words can be when their teams are backs up against the wall with Thomas Tuchel and his influence for Chelsea. So, yep, keen to have a great chat, guys. 100%. Scott, my man, how you doing? I'm good. Two wins back to back, boys. And I think, <laughs> and no, this is the second episode now where both our teams have won. So, mm. shouldn't be too much better. Um, it's, it's starting to get a little bit sunnier in our part of London. So yeah, happy man. days. Happy days. Yeah, no, no, no banter, no banter. Obviously, you guys got Spurs. I'm actually tipping you guys to beat Spurs. Um, wow. Unless if Spurs kind of maintain the way they play for the first half against mm. us, if they can maintain for 90 minutes, maybe then you guys are a bit of a in for a bit of a shock. But you guys have been doing all right. Clean sheets, one nil victories. It's it's about momentum. It's about bu building that momentum. But we'll see. We'll see it's early days. Um, Norwich and Burnley was expected to win. You yourself, Scott, said that that's where the season started. Norwich and Burnley. Yep. It's yep. very important now what you guys do against Spurs. I think it'll be a very interesting match because Spurs now back to back losses. You guys back to back wins. Back to back wins. So, but you, uh, you know what? You know what? Is with a derby, form goes out the window. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, you, you guys have seen that too. Like, who knows what's going to happen? All I know is we're, we're in for a, a hell of a show. I think it'll be a great game. So no, for looking sure, forward man, to that for one. Sure. There could be some red cards flying around as well. If Shaq is around, you know what's happening. Mm, we'll see. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get the show rock and rolling. Meanwhile, smash the like button. Uh, get those likes up. We've got nearly 20 people live. Actually, we've just crossed 20. Um, smash the like button. It helps the channel out a lot. It helps the growth of this particular show a lot as well. And make sure you check out the boys and their socials in the description, which I will show down the track. Um, I'll create uh, another window and show you guys. It's all in, in the description. You just basically click. It will go to the page and you subscribe. That's pretty much what it is. Let's help the boys out as well um, uh, throughout this process. Okay. Let's get the show rolling. Love it, man. Love it. I'm starting to think, you know, when we talked about creating the intro and we were sort of thinking oh, about seven seconds, so on and so forth. I'm starting to think maybe it would have been all right if it was a bit longer. Maybe if it was like about 20 seconds or something, maybe it would have been oh. nice. 
We could just have an hour long stream on that and just, just chill out. Good vibes. <laughs> just, just have that on just non stop on repeat. Very good. Um, really, really good. Uh, live chat, really, really appreciate uh, you guys being here. Flyers, thank you so much. Flyers, honestly, uh, if you're here, I, I do want to ask you what do you mean by yes, Ms., but what's going on on the other side of the coin? I, I've never understood what you mean by that. So do put it in the comments if, if that has some sort of meaning because I don't know how to reply to that. Um, great, Ehian, thank you so much for uh, be, being in the show. Um, Benolo, thank you heaps for being in the show. Frederick, really, really good. By the way, guys, Frederick's from Sweden, so huh. we're playing Malmo, um, and he may be mm. actually going to melt that particular match, so nice. do look out for that. If, if that happens, then maybe we can get some footage from Frederick. Come on, Malmo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Declare, thank you so much for joining. Uh, good morning. Let's go, Chelsea. Good morning. Yeah. Um, Declare, how about, how about some good evening for the people that, that live in Australia? Uh, that'd be that'd be much appreciated as well. Uh, Tumusiel, thank you so much for joining. Roby, thank you heaps um, for joining as well. Uh, Roby saying, yeah, make, make it longer. Make it longer. Uh, I, yeah. I, th I think we, we'll, we'll, do, we'll, we'll definitely think about this. Um, we'll go to the drawing board and we'll really think about this. Um, but yeah, nearly 30 of you guys are live right now. Smash the like button straight away and get those um, likes up alongside the people that are in the lives. And also, if you're here for the first time, subscribe. Check out the boys and their socials in the description. As I said, uh, once we have a little bit more people, we will show you guys, um, you know, a bit, of, a bit of footage as to, you know, how, how to navigate around. Let's let's get the boys with some um, subscription as well. RJ, let's, let's get into this topic, right? The whole ideology behind managers being the centerpiece, the most important factor in a particular team. What I mean by that, and, and I want to use the example of the Spurs game, and not just that, obviously recently played Aston Villa to, uh, as well, where Thomas Tuchel changed something at halftime. But specifically Spurs, RJ, Thomas Tuchel, I mean, he's got this nature that, has we've seen a bit of it last season, obviously, but we're seeing a lot more this season as he's getting more comfortable with the team, as the team's getting more comfortable with him. When he senses danger, he does not hesitate. He changes to rectify the situation so we can go on top, specifically against Spurs. Let's just analyze that a little bit. They were on top of us for, for the first, probably I'd say, Good 30 minutes. They were pressing mm. well, yeah. attacking behind our wing backs, really causing a lot of havoc. And it seemed like we didn't have enough grip in the midfield, even though Jorginho and Kovacic were great. But we've always said a player like Mason will drop in to create that sort of three in midfield. Sometimes Havertz will drop in. We just didn't get enough impetus from both Mount and Havertz. And then surely yeah. enough at half time. Thomas Tuchel makes the change. I mean, he could have easily pulled out Havertz if he had to, but I think he kept in Havertz up front with Lukaku. Well, yeah, I think the play. whole, yeah, the whole point was like you said, though, Miz, because the, the analogy I like to draw with that particular first half is a bow tie. And think about mm. it this way. You've got your defence, that's the thick part. In the middle, you've got the midfield, and again, you've got your front free. So you're yeah. heavy at the back, you're heavy at the front. We look quite light in the middle. And Thomas Tuchel identified that we were getting overrun in that middle area. Mm -hmm. So it just made sense to try to plug the hole because, as you would have seen clearly in that first half, Lo Celso was a really important fact, and Dombele, they were finding themselves in really good positions to really push or to really bring out the likes of Rudiger. There was that one scene when Rudiger was dragged yeah. out and they played the ball in for Son, but Kepa, to his credit, anticipated it. Yeah. So Tuchel, like you said, analysed it, was swift to make the change. Mm. And then not just that, RJ, there was another opportunity where I think Andres Christensen from the RCB position just rushed in a little bit yes. on, I believe, Deli Ali, and Deli Ali was smart enough to quickly Flip. turn yeah. uh, and, and really take advantage of that space. I don't know whether it was Regulon or um, it was Son as well again, but they got into some tasty position, and at that time... Rudiger came in and blocked off that opportunity. So basically what I want to ask you, RJ, how important is it for a top club? I mean, any clubs, but specifically the top ones that are going for silverware, the difference maker where 
Thomas Tuchel realized that issue and halftime did not hesitate to take out Mason Mount, who's literally one of the bigger players in Chelsea. He's Football our player of the season, our reigning player, player of the season. season. There you go. Mm. Pulled him off because, let's be honest, he didn't have a very good game. He didn't have a very good game against Zenit either. And then plugged in Kante and Kante, game changer. All of a sudden, mm. the identity of the game just changed. And we were all over them like a rash from minute one of the second half. Surely enough, we get the first goal. Kante bangs in the second. Fine, lucky, but still the intent was there as to what he wanted to do. And then we get the third one as well. Probably could have got fourth or fifth. So, Ajay, how important is it for clubs that are vying for silverware that you have a manager like Thomas Tuchel-esque sort of stature who can change games like that? Yeah, look, to me, it's there. It's, it's such a high premium to be able to find the right manager. And the right manager is not the smartest manager. It's not the loudest manager. Mm. It's not It's not like the most wise manager either. It's someone that knows how to fit in their environment. So understand the club, their expectations, first and foremost. Secondly, it's someone that knows how to endear themselves with the fan base and really embrace the culture. But more importantly, it's someone that knows how to demonstrate tactical nous and flexibility mm. and to gain that credibility amongst the playing group because you've got to appreciate the fact that these aren't under sixes like my son's team where you tell them anything, they'll buy it because you're an adult. These are seasoned professionals, even if they're 19 or 29 or 37 like Thiago Silva's just about to be incredibly, yeah. which is a subplot. But the point <laughs> is these are very knowledgeable people in their profession they are professional football players they need to respect their manager mm -hmm. so for someone like you said how important is it it's 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 crucial to their success because if you have someone there that lacks in any of those categories i mentioned they're going to pick at them like a hawk because mm -hmm. you'll quickly lose the dressing room if you can't get it can't not only um, establish that credibility but to sustain it so when Tuchel came in, obviously it was at a real time of crisis for the club. Let's be let's be frank, no pun intended. But <laughs> he quickly took a team in a siege mode, isolated the problem, plugged the hole, defensively speaking, and really made them, in his words, a team difficult to beat. And yeah. he's continued to fulfil that promise. But along the way, he's now worked on improving their attacking outlet. So for me, in a very short and succinct way, it's absolutely fundamental that you have a manager that knows how to get the best out of those three things. Culture, credibility, and yeah. tactical acumen. That's the best way I'd describe it. No, absolutely well said. CFC Florida, thank you so much for the super chat. Good morning. Keep the blue flag flying high. Thank you so much. Um, Scott, I want to now ask you Arteta's sort of point of view. Try and compare that with, let's say, someone like Tuchel or someone like Pep or someone like Moyes or some of the top Jurgen Klopp. I mean, what do you see at times that, ooh, that's where Arteta could have done something different or his technical now, as people tend to think him working under Pep Guardiola, he should have learned a lot, you know, working so closely with him. Do you at times see Scott in games that, he could have done something different there just to get an advantage. I know your team is not necessarily the strongest squad out there, but your manager could still be the key factor in making them hard to beat, I suppose. Well, it's, it's a tricky one, Miss, because comparing Thomas Tuchel and Mikel Arteta, it's, it's apples and oranges. I mean... The one thing they've got in common is they're both football managers. But, th but that's where it stops. Tuchel's experience, Tuchel's won things. I mean, I know I better won an FA Cup. Um, Tuchel comes in commanding respect because he's managed one of the biggest clubs in the world to win PSG. Yeah. So he's not come in as an unknown. Mikel Arteta's come in as an unknown. And I feel like he's – and I, I'm a teacher by, by day. You guys know that. And I see this mistake all the time. People come in and think that the way to get respect or, you know, the best approach is to come in really hard, really what, 
firm, strict. Tear up the team, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I see that in teaching, but then I look at Arteta. I feel like Arteta came in, and he's he's operating that way, and that's just inexperience. Mm. It's inexperience. He he has shown that he is quite stubborn by nature, um, but slowly but surely, when things get really bad, he does then tend to shake it up. My major criticism of him is he waits too long. We shouldn't have to be at rock bottom before he changes things up. Emil Smith-Rowe, who Mikel Arteta gets a lot of credit for, he wasn't played for half the season. Uh, Arteta yeah. refused to use him. It was only when we kind of hit rock bottom after fans had been calling for Smith-Rowe to play half the season that he played him. So I think it's a little bit of an experience. Um, yeah. And, and I think Frank, Frank Lampard potentially may have been someone who suffered from that as well. It's... It's oh, amazing yeah. how Thomas Tuchel has turned the same squad around and made them look different like that. So I think mm. it might have been young and inexperienced managers tend to come in saying, this is my philosophy, we're doing it my way, um, I'm setting my standards really high, and if you don't meet them, you're going to feel the, the force. And sometimes that's not the best way to be. You've also got to trust in your players and mm. and let them know that they're part of the process as well. No, 100%. It's so true. I'm just thinking from my, and I'll go to RJ on this one. I'm just thinking from my work perspective as well. I'm pretty sure you guys can relate to this too, what I'm about to say. It's like when, you, when you've when you had an experienced manager for a very, very long time, and then you see one of your colleagues take that management role when your current manager has moved on, and you mm. kind of feel, uh I feel like I've got more experience than you. Like, I know you got the job. I know I didn't go for the job for management, but you got it. But I can't seem to give you complete respect because I feel like you don't know everything. Like, I feel like I know more than you. Do you, do you sometimes and, it's all, it's, and it's also part of, like, the one of the boys mentality, isn't it? Like, when you've been in the same dressing room not too long, and I think it's across all sports, isn't it, when you have that feeling? And you're right. This is exactly what I wanted to sort of touch on, that Arteta being an Arsenal player, I don't know if he's played with any of the current mob, though. Did he play with any of um, them? I'm just trying to think. No, I think Aubameyang came just after him. I bet he, he was in and around the club still. He was in and around the club. So, RJ, what I want to ask you is that that point is quite important, that you can't just bring in any sort of young non sort of tried manager and expect miracles to happen. I mean, the whole ideology of buying, going back to the Thomas Tuchel situation, RJ, it takes guts to take a player off at half time and, and change things. Because you really need to think about the confidence level of that particular player by doing that. Because for a player, no one wants to get subbed off at half time, right? RJ, I mean, Villa mm. so all got subbed off, and rightly so. He was so off track. Yeah, he was he was yeah, exactly. Dreadful. It was dreadful. But you could know as a manager, if I do this, I have to make sure that I do the the follow on, the follow ups after that to ensure that this player understands why I did what I did. There's some feedback. I mean, yeah. How important is the whole package to have uh -huh. that as a manager, uh, as opposed to what Scott was saying about Arteta? Mm. Well, it's like any leader, Miz. Like I know the saying, leaders of behaviour, not a title mentality. But for me, it's all about, and this is what we're speaking about with John Aloisi around establishing that culture. And But another, you know, C word that's actually quite fundamental is communication. Yeah. You need to have that. And it's so cool. I know it might sound like a given, but like you mentioned the experienced manager versus one of our friends that gets the promotion and, might be technically quite superior, but when push comes to shove, he might not, or she or might, or he might not have the right head on their shoulders in terms of seeing the bigger picture. So mm. the whole Mount situation and even Saul, what's important is that the manager balances having the right level of empathy, having the right level of um, foresight, to, to foreshadow any problems that might arise in a big squad, especially in a squad like Chelsea. And I'll touch on what Scott said about the chalk and cheese difference. 
Mm. Chelsea notoriously are difficult because of their large squad to manage of big personalities. So it's not always about just picking the best 11 for the game. It's equally important about the players you don't pick so they don't disrupt the team balance and yeah. what happens in the, in the locker room. So to me, in terms of Thomas Tuchel knowing how to manage different sets of stakeholders, the media is in one corner. The mm. starting players are the other stakeholder. The rest of the squad players are the other group of stakeholders in the board. The way he's able to um, manoeuvre and pivot between each of those sets of stakeholders and keep everybody reasonably happy through his trusted principles of being transparent and sincere, but mm. backing that up, that can only take you so far. Being as honest, I can be as honest as I like, but if mm. I don't have if I don't have the um, substance to back it up, I'm going to lose that credibility very quickly. Yeah. So it's such a rare thing to be able to balance all of those sort of key things. And to your point, Scott, about Arteta and Tuchel, the only similarity is their occupation. I totally agree. Like Tuchel had come from, you know, a completely um, crazy environment in PSG where success mm. was the standards one, two, and three, and he had mixed degrees of it. But obviously Arteta comes into it, and I agree with you with Frank, is that one thing I did like about Frank during his time is he was actually quite decent at his tactical substitutions, but mm. arguably, and, you know, it'd be interesting to hear what his thoughts on it down the track, he probably learned a lot about maybe moving a little bit away from his preferred policy on things yeah. and being a little bit more pragmatic at times, a bit more so, even though he might mm -hmm. call a few other factors. But the point with Tuchel, he's been around the block long enough and not just mm -hmm. been around the block long enough, he's been in the right type of chaotic environment that he knew when he was walking into Chelsea, it wasn't going to be such a shock to the system that this is, you know, success is yesterday, not tomorrow, but needed to be done. So rounding it off, what Thomas Tuchel continues to show managers like Arteta, you know, like managers like Moyes, which we'll touch on in a moment, even mm. Bielsa is a very good example here because I have a lot of respect for what Leeds have done last season mm. and what he's done with them since taking over. But comparisons between Bielsa and someone like Maurizio Sarri is that I think part of their biggest downfall is while they don't have the same quality of players, I agree, it's not apples and apples, what they do have the ability to do is change their own approach to things. And I sometimes think that they're a victim of their own tactical rigidity and mm. belief and dogness, doggedness in their own philosophy. So I'll leave it at that. No, for sure, man. Scott, this is a very interesting comment from Roby. Roby, thank you so much for this particular comment because this is now the next part we want to talk about. We want to talk about a few other managers as well and sort of tying in this whole sort of big message that how important is the manager uh, when it comes to winning silverware. And at times, they literally become the 12th man. But before we do that, we've got nearly 80 people live. So what we're going to do is, guys, let's smash the like button, number one. Um, get those likes up to 80 straight away. Let's try and see if we can achieve um, 100 likes for the stream, which will be brilliant. But most importantly, as well, as well as you can see, you guys can see ourselves in the screen. Um, literally, just uh, if you scroll down to the description, click on the boys and their YouTube channel. It will take you to a different page. Almost channel. at 400 subs now, Miz. Just wanted to throw it into the realm. We've got 80 odd people watching. I'm sure we can boost that up easily. This is exactly what we're going to aim for. So, the It's a Football Podcast YouTube channel, um, literally, it's all in the description. All you got to do is just click the button, it takes you to the page and subscribe. Hit that subscribe button. The boys are 19 away from uh, 400 subscribers. Please, it'll be. Uh, an immense feat, uh, I believe, for the boys to reach that. And then slowly we can try and get them to 500. But 19 at least would be tremendous if we can get that to 400. Um, and then obviously any more than that is an absolute bonus. But let's try and get to 400. Um, Scott, let's talk about this particular point. Very, very important point from Ruby. Now, I didn't watch this match, but I saw the highlights of it. And, and I saw the sort of articles post the match. 
this one, Ole didn't sub off Ronaldo when they needed to against young boys and it cost them. Now, what I sort of read and I saw the timeline of the of the whole match, Man United were leading. Then they got the red card. Then po- probably Ronaldo needed to come off because let's be honest, when you're a man down and you are leading, Ronaldo is not going to be the one that's going to be chasing around. Like he's not going to be off the ball doing a whole heap of hard work and whatnot. Probably would have made sense to take him off and bring in someone else, I don't know who. But then at 1-1, one, one, or I think it might have been 1-1. One, yeah, I think it was 1-1. One, one. He then takes Ronaldo off when Ronaldo is probably the guy who's probably going to score a goal for you and possibly win it. So he's made a blunder and then followed it up with another blunder. That's what I sort of feel. I mean, this is exactly what I'm saying, where a manager is kind of detrimental to their team. I know they, they ended up winning against West Ham. Really, they shouldn't have. At the end, Mark Noble. And I didn't watch the match. The boys will let, let us know exactly what happened there. But I've always said it. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is a particular manager that relies on the individuals. I have not seen him tactically outdo anyone within the match. So, yeah. Scott, what, what do you have to say about this particular comment? Look, before I start, big ups to, I think it's Razik. I hope I said that right. Straight away, Miz, as soon as you put our channel up, he's jumped over and subbed. Big ups to you, man. Th- thank you for the support. Uh, we, we love collaborating with Miz and the community over here too. Look, for me, when I'm judging a manager, I try not to just look at individual moments, right? Now, let's. I want to quickly go back to Thomas Tuchel for 20 seconds. Just entertain me before I go back to Ollie. I know we're calling it a masterstroke by Thomas Ducal, yeah? Um, the sub, bringing on Kante, all of that. L- let's look at it in isolation. He brought on N'Golo Kante. Well, he-, he hasn't brought on someone from the youth. Like, he's brought on a world-class midfielder. That's true. Yeah. One of the best. Different the profiles, though. Different yeah, profiles. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. But I-, I would hope that bringing on Kante, he can help you reclaim dominance in the midfield which then has a flow-on effect to dominate the game. Coming to Oli, right, looking at the, the young boy's situation, I don't judge Oli just on that. With him, I look at him over his tenure uh, at Man United. Now, one thing the three of us have in common, and probably all the live chat, we don't like Man United. <laughs> and one good way to prove you don't like Man United is to sub to it's a football thing. It's a good way to let them know. Um, <laughs> but... I can't. They're, they're a huge club. They're, they're a mm. footballing institution, yeah? Mm. My biggest criticism of them is how can you have this guy at the helm who, even boys was not a one-off. They constantly make ridiculous mistakes like this. Yeah. And I know, like, if Robbie was here now, he'd be telling me, you know, we finished really high on the table last season. Yeah, but they didn't kind of win. And the reason they didn't was because of the little mistakes. Yeah. Now, with Oli, I find he's, there's just too many of them. He's mm. now in a position, I think signing Ronaldo and Varane really intensifies the pressure on him because he's now not, gone. Not just, that, not just that, Scott. I feel like he was already not the most important factor in the team. But now with Ronaldo, I think Ronaldo owns that team. Did you see the footage, yeah. Miz and RJ, of mm. Oli in the technical area? And he has Ronaldo kind of standing behind him with like his arms up as if Ronaldo was giving um, <laughs> what was yelling at him. And yeah. that's what was happening. Ronaldo was in the technical area after he'd come off. Nah. To me, could you picture one of the players doing that when Thomas Tuchel was in his technical area? Yeah, but that's the thing, honestly. But that's we might have a bit of a joke here because obviously Ronaldo wanted to go back to United, or at least that's what we're told because of his relationship and and the prospects of where that team's going for him to quickly win some more trophies before, you know, and end to an illustrious career. But I think there's also part of it there where the manager is important for him to be able to dictate things on his terms. So yeah. if he was to go to somewhere that's a little bit more, you know, robust and had a little bit of stone behind him and told him, look, you're not playing the way we want, hook you off after 20 minutes or 45 minutes, he wants to run the show. So I think someone like Ollie 
is an enabler to allow his old buddy to get away with that sort of thing, if you know what I mean. So mm -hmm. I think personality and strength is a big one. And that's probably one thing about Ollie is that I actually like the fact that he he lets his players have a lot of freedom, but I think mm -hmm. he probably doesn't have a lot of balance in reining that freedom in when it's not working. So mm -hmm. he's got to be able to demonstrate, you'd like this one, Mears, the other side of the coin where he's got to be <laughs> able to have that strength in him. And look, when we spoke just to, to interject Mark, as well, just, yeah, on, just to interject on. before you make your next point, because a fantastic point that you just said, the freedom is great, RJ, but you do need to know when to trigger that freedom. You, ca you can't just go out there and just ball out like, do you know what I mean? Whatever, yeah. what, do whatever the you know, hell that you want to do, you can't, <laughs> there needs to be some form of planning, a structure. You know, for instance, you can't you can't have Let's say if you've got three midfielders, right? You can't have all three just bomb up all together and leave mm. exposing your defense. Like, there's got to be freedom needs to have some sort of... It's freedom within established boundaries. And that's exactly, the principles. Exactly. I know, we don't like It's not the Thomas Tuchel recap show, but that's that sort of mentality that managers like that know how to balance players using their brains, but not placing all of that trust in the player because ultimately the player is there to execute the strategy set by the manager, not the mm -hmm. strategy set by the individual player. Because you, you have three of us that we all have different trains of thought. Imagine that when you've got 11 highly qualified professional footballers, they have a general target. They all want to go out there and win, mm -hmm. but they've all got slight nuances in the way they want to execute it. And if you allow that to happen, then you're going to have more than likely a disjointed performance. So you need someone to really set that direction. So Oli, he allows a lot of trust, which is good in some instances, but then in others, I feel like when the going gets tough, the tough really gets going with him yeah. and he just doesn't know how. And maybe this is just not a personality trait. It could be a lack of experience trait and he might grow out of this whole experience, but the signs aren't looking good for him that – if I'm a Man United supporter and Scott used the word institution, it just doesn't seem a right fit. And Robbie will say, no. Ollie knows the club's fabric and it's important yeah. to them as a club that they have someone that understands their way of football. But equally, perhaps as me as an outsider, my understanding of Manchester United as an institution is that winning is equally a part of their fabric. So how, mm. uh, which part of the fabric is more important in the long run? I would say the latter, but that's just my opinion. I and, and I would say that part of, you talk about Oli giving the players freedom, yeah, let him go and express themselves. Is that because he doesn't know what best to do with the pieces he's got? He, he's, it's like playing a game of chess. Oh, I can go and move the, the, puzzle, the pieces freely, but if I don't know what I'm doing with the pieces, I don't have a plan. It's just going to be Pete. Yeah, I mean, my, checkmate. <laughs> my, my kid loves freedom. He, he wishes I'd let him go free all day, but he's too. He'd end up doing. I think it's also. Because... I think it's also part a little bit tactically, but even I think just personality tactically wise. Naive. But it's tactically naive. But I think it's also about him perhaps balancing too much, trying to prioritize squad harmony, and not wanting to have those difficult conversations when he feels like he doesn't need to unless absolutely pushed because he seems like a kind of guy who wants to make everyone happy. And as you know, in a squad, it's not about making everybody happy as long as everybody's right. pushing in the same direction. That's the main thing. So 100%. I don't know. 100%. Daniel, thank you so much for this comment. Big up, lads. I share similar sentiments regarding Sosha. He needs to he needs to well and truly step up in terms of his European record uh, for sure. There's no doubt about that. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got nearly 100 live. Smash the like button. Let's get the likes up to 100. It'd be amazing, amazing um, sort of achievement if we can get to 100 likes within the stream. And also check out the boys and their socials. Uh, let me just bring this up again. Literally, this is the stream that's going on. It's in the description as soon as you click on the YouTube sort of channel a link, which is, you know, it's, it's literally in the description, as I said, click on it. It takes you to their page. Subscribe. Let's get the boys to 400 subscribers, which will be an amazing, amazing achievement. Let's do 16 that. Ago, 16 to go, Miz. 16 to go. There you go, time. guys. 16. Let's get the 16. We can do this. We can honestly do this. So let's get the 16. Get the boys up to 400 subscribers.
Scott, we've talked about some sort of high profile teams, obviously, you know, in terms of Chelsea, Man United, Arsenal, and so on. Yeah, more or less a high profile team. I mean, these days, not so much, but that's a different story. I want to talk about Brighton, though, Scott. Mm-hmm. Graham Potter. Now, we've talked about managers in big clubs and what they need to do. We now have another example with Graham Potter in Brighton. They don't necessarily have all the ingredients to go toe-to-toe with everyone, but this particular manager, and I've seen a lot of Brighton last season. It's a shame I haven't been able to see enough of them this season. There's so much football to keep up with, but I do want to catch some of their games. So I've seen enough of their games last season, though. They play beautiful football. They they build up from the back. Nice. They've basically got they've got an idea. Like they assess the opposition. They go, how do we want to attack this opposition? We'll attack them from the left, or we'll attack them from the right. We'll attack them from the middle. If it's from the right, we're going to try and create an overload. We're going to try and create a nice sort of formation which will allow us to build up and attack in their sort of weakness and whatnot. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that Scott Graham Potter puts a lot of thought. And it seems like his players buy into that thought. And he's a perfect example. And I know for a certainty, I know they're like, what, fourth or f- they're fifth at the moment? Or sixth, something like that? Let me just have a quick look at this. They're fourth. They're, they're, um, they're, they're fourth. fourth. They're fourth after five games. Yeah. 12 points. Now, we all know they're not going to be there for, for the long run. I mean, it'll be a miracle if they end up being in the, you know, top four I, i'm pretty certain they're not going to be there but i'm not surprised scott with that run because last season they had an xg incredible as rj was saying an xg of top six club so scott how do you see when a manager of his caliber that is working with that budget getting so much out of that particular team i mean what do you say about that to me, and I think RJ kind of unpacked this earlier, you, you need a few things to have a successful club. Your manager needs to have integrity. Your manager needs to have tactical nous. You need the squad. And you need the personality where you can command the respect of your players hmm. um, without making them not want to play for you. So I think Graham Potter is in the perfect situation for him. He's at a club where there aren't really the egos that are going to challenge him. He's got a squad that suits his style of play. He's definitely got the tactical uh, tactical knowledge. He's, he's killing that. But, I mean, I, I kind of look at managers and I don't necessarily think if you took uh, Graham Potter and put him in Man- at Manchester United right now that they'd instantly become contenders because yeah. all those things need to click. Yeah, I think that they'd have a better chance with him, but then I wonder, because of his personal profile, would he command the respect of a Cristiano Ronaldo or Mm -hmm. guys like that where it could get really toxic? So I think he's in the best possible place for him. And I look at someone like Brendan Rodgers. Yeah. He started at Liverpool. Things kind of... uh, He didn't start at Liverpool, but he had his big break at Liverpool. Things kind of didn't go the way they were meant to go for him. So he stepped away to a new environment. He went and learned how to win over in Celtic, and he's come back now, and I think he's better. In saying that, not the best start for Leicester. Um, yeah, but he, I'll be worried. They're not looking. They look shaky. Yeah, but but he's gone and learned. He's, he's improved mm. his trade, and sometimes managers need certain clubs at certain times to improve. I just think managers like Arteta or Ollie were in the are in the wrong place at the wrong time. They need yeah. they needed Arteta needed a Celtic first before an Arsenal. No, fair point. I mean RJ, mm. how do you how do you look at that perspective of these sort of caliber of managers that tend to get so much out of their team? And we've seen many other examples all over Europe as well, not just in the Premier League. There's you know managers in in, in La Liga, there's managers in you know whether it be in the uh, League One or Bundesliga as well, they tend to get so much from such limited budget. I mean, you look at someone like Thomas Tuchel, for instance, back in Dortmund days, or even Mainz. Thomas Tuchel had a 
history of doing well. Do you know what I mean? Back in Mainz, Mainz were a relegation battle team and he brought them into top six to the point where they were in Europa League at one stage. So, I mean, RJ, what do you have to say about managers like Graham Potter as well? I mean, they are the biggest X factor for that particular team because I feel like Brighton, if they were to get let go of Graham Potter and let's say they bring in someone else, I don't know who else is out there. They just wouldn't be able to compete the way they're doing now. Like, they shouldn't be competing already. I find it very, very amazing, the fact that they've been doing so well. Yeah, that's no, a good point. And Scott made some good points about um, Potter there over at I And he'll know, based on our time at IFT, that I've been a big supporter of him. And and I know to an extent you're, you're as good as your last performance in terms of translating potential or stats into the actual stat of winning and getting the results. So bright and flattered to deceive on that front. But statistics do paint a good picture in terms of your overall style and, and our actual approach to playing games. And I'm not surprised with how good they're going, whether or not they can sustain it is obviously a big question mark because it is a long season. There's so many variables up in the air that can in interfere with their nice run at the moment. In that whole Leicester game, by the way, I did feel that they probably did get away with the win in the end because I thought Leicester did have some crucial moments that they kind of just, you know, weren't clutch enough to take. And that's been a little bit mm -hmm. the story of their season with their defence being a bit of a question mark. But Potter, over the medium to long-term horizon, has done a really good job with Brighton. And managers like him, and I like managers like Scott Parker, Thomas Frank, what he's doing with Brentford at the moment, um, what we're seeing, the commonality between these managers and their teams is the environment that they're operating in. Like Scott mm -hmm. said, if you go and pick them up and go move them over to a club that has really high expectations for winning yesterday, it's going to be really difficult to translate it, not because they're going to suddenly forget how to come up with the right ideas and analyse and break down the game, mm -hmm. but it's about taking everyone on the journey, so to speak. And it's really about having, and this comes back to our earlier, what, what are the sort of the key attributes or key ingredients that make a top manager? It's, it's more than understanding how to move the chess pieces. It's understanding how those chess pieces behave and what makes them tick. And you get players like Ronaldo, are they going to listen to a guy that they've never heard of when he's <laughs> won a Ballon d'Or six, you know what I mean? You know, with all due respect, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Like yeah. his stature in the game where his ego requires its own set of tactical masterclass because you really need to manage that. But I think managers like that will use clubs with respect like Brighton, like Watford, like Brentford and co, even Bielsa at Leeds, which I know he's a little bit of an asterisk. Yeah. They use these clubs as platforms for higher honours. And that's what Dortmund's been like, Mainz have been like that. La Liga with the clubs of like Sevilla, Villarreal, even in Italy, you've got clubs like Sassuolo, Lazio, mm -hmm. Napoli to an extent, even though in the Serie A, the top six now is looking really strong and competitive this season. You kind of need, this is the beauty of having these top leagues, is that you not only do you unearth great talent in terms of the players, but you get to also watch the great up-and-coming managers do their thing in an environment that allows them to express themselves without mm -hmm. the fear of having their job questioned each result if it doesn't go their way each week. Like Arteta at Arsenal, if he was to go and take over somewhere like a Wolves, for example, just throwing a name out there, I bet you we would be talking about his influence in a lot more positive light. I but think because, so. But because yeah. he's at a club that, you know, has so much proud history and wants to get back to winning ways, Every time he has a bad result, it's, oh, geez, this was a bad decision. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just context. Yeah. yeah. No, you're right. And this is exactly what Scott was saying. Arteta probably should have gone to a club like Celtic before mm. he moved to Arsenal, culture, where, yeah. where he learned how to win. I, and I find this a bit strange. And I want to ask this to Scott. Uh, by the way, Brent Smith, really good comment here. Probably it's smaller managers at bigger clubs is the managers of the whim of the board. Now, Scott. Mm. Arteta was part of Pep Guardiola's squad, though. Like, he would have seen all sorts of winning, you know, silverwares and whatnot. He would have got that winning mentality. I know he wasn't in charge, but 
I've seen some some document documentaries, especially that um, All or Nothing, uh, where Man City, yeah. um, you know, got, yeah. you know, Pep Guardiola really trusted Arteta a lot, like really took his advice, you know, with a lot of trust. I mean, how's has he not been able to sort of translate that in Arsenal, or, or does he fall into this category? What Brent Smith's talking about? Oh, look, it, it's hard to say when you're not inside. And big ups to Brent. And thanks for jumping over and subbing, mate. Uh, really appreciate it. It's, it's very hard to say. A, a classic example, I'm kind of going to answer your question with another question. Hmm. Look at Sir Alex Ferguson. I'm pretty sure he's number two for most of his time at Man United was, a, was Carlos Quiros. Um, I think so. Portuguese manager. I think so. I, think so. And I thought his number two was he, still the guy he, who's number two now. With Man United, uh, he the Carlos Quiroz then moved yeah. off, and live chat can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sure I'm right. Um, he's moved on, and he could never quite hit those heights, despite learning under Sir Alex. You know what I mean? You mm. you look at even um, at Arsenal. You had Pat Rice, who was always under Arsene Wenger. Pat Rice yeah, yeah. Ne never stepped out and did that. Yeah. So for me, Arteta had a particular role. And I actually think Arteta, I could see him being an excellent coach because of how stubborn he is. Like if he had a specific targeted technical thing to work on, he mm. could. But as the manager, it's not just his responsibility in the kind of work on the passing or the attacking movement. He's got to look at the big picture. He's got to be yeah. focusing on his defenders. He's got to look at his formations. He's got all these other voices in his ear. I just think from coach to manager, he's just a crazy step up. I would it's hope that he's... It's I feel like what point. he's inherited from Pep, RJ, sorry to cut you off, man. I feel like what he's inherited from Pep is that kind of stubborn nature. Yeah. But the thing yeah. is, Pep can be stubborn. He's won it all. Yeah. Our tennis not mm. quite there, so I think that can no. rub people up the wrong way. Yeah. No, no. I was going to say, I just wanted to mention what I was saying, the great point about is the whole the uh, bridesmaid not becoming the bride type of mentality or that <laughs> sort of issue because you're right. It's it's one thing to be the the Robin in this case, but Robin's never not always going to assume the Batman role and it's naive to think that it's just like you mentioned earlier, Ms. that you once removed, you get the promotion and all of a sudden things are just going to yeah. go swimmingly. It just, it's nothing is, especially in football world, to, to graduate to the highest of honours in becoming top dog manager. It's not that binary. And mm -hmm. and this is, comes back to that whole, again, the key ingredients. Part of the key ingredients of becoming a top manager is all those different stakeholder groups you've got to manage. And the yeah. one big stakeholder, or well, the two big stakeholder groups that number two doesn't really, number two being the coach, doesn't have to really man manage is A, the media, and B, the board, and really, for for all intensive purposes, the number two of any club, they don't have any real accountability or ownership. Their head's mm. not on the chopping block when, when you know, the peripheral hits the fan. So it's, it's a lot easier, quote, unquote, to be a really effective number two, which yeah. don't get me wrong, I look at Jody Morris and the great job he'd done with Frank at the time at Chelsea and even now, or even with Zola back with um, Surrey. But the reality is it's the uneven playing fields in terms of both responsibility and accountability. And number mm. two, it's not the simple way I can put this, doing the job of a number two is not a very good indicator to see how you'll go for a top dog role just because there's too many other factors that are unknown. And like you so, said, so Carlos so Quiroz, he fell off the wayside. But then you look at Brendan Rodgers. How good was he as our number two at Chelsea? Yep. He went off and done his own thing, and now he's become fully established as one of the one of the top, top managers, in my mm. opinion. So I think it just comes down to both the individual in terms of their own personality and adjustability mm -hmm. when when the time comes for them to step up into the top role, but also the environment that allows them to operate without that pressure cooker situation. Now, it's so well said, RJ. And this is, 
the, the last sort of manager that I want to really talk about, I know there's plenty of other managers that we can as well. There's some fine stories, but the one that I really want to just quickly touch on before we sort of wrap this whole conversation about the managers, I've got to use Scott and then I will see what RJ has to say. Scott, you, both RJ and Scott initially, you said the same thing as well, that the environment is so important. You know, Graham Potter can't just move from Brighton and then come to, let's say, Man United and switch things around. The other example is David Moyes. We've seen him do so well at Everton. At Everton at one stage was flying under him. Do you mm. know what I mean? Like one of the top, top clubs under him at, at that point in the Premier League. I, I still even remember they were, they were, they were you know, in qualifications for Champions League at times. And I think they might have even made Champions League once. can't recall completely, but I think they might have under, under David Moyes. Uh, live chat, once again, correct me if I'm wrong. Scott, we've seen him leave Everton handpicked by Sir Alex Ferguson to go to Man United. Didn't do well. It was a bit too much for him. Comes back to West Ham. I don't know whether he had any other jobs in between uh, after uh, Man United. I'm not sure. But now he's come back to West Ham. They were in the brink of getting relegated. They survived that. Last season, an absolute breakout season. And this season... They look like one of the teams that proper other clubs are not willing to face them. They've got a nice sort of, you know, good squad, great flair up front with Ben Rama, and, you know, they've got Antonio, blockbuster striker. Um, they've got other good nifty players like Bowen, good solid in midfield with Declan Rice and Suchek. And they've, got, they've got our boy Zuma in the back. I mean, Scott, that whole ideology that not every manager is great in top clubs, but they can still be great in sort of mid-table sort of clubs. I mean, how, how, how do you say, look, we've talked about Bielsa, we've talked about, you know, um, obviously Graham Porter, but I feel like David Moyes sort of fits into that mold as well where he's still a top manager. Like, he's still got that mm. technical nous and all of that, but it's just not good enough for a top club, but for a mid-table club, still still pretty good. Because he also had stints at a Sunderland and Real associate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, yeah. He's he's been around, like, but it didn't work at Man United. In saying that, he wasn't given the backing or the patience that uh, Ollie's been given either. Like, if they'd have backed him with what they've given Ollie and that much patience, <laughs> yeah. it would be very interesting to see what happens because he's a much better manager, significantly better. Um. But I think with Moyes, he's he's gone to West Ham and he, he's been put in the right position. Like like I keep saying, it's about where you are. It's like planting a seed. If you plant a seed in sand, it's not going to grow. But if you plant it in good soil, it'll grow. So he, he's gone well there. And he's got into the squad who's mentality and uh, physical attributes match the way he wants to play. And he's turned West Ham into a force. I'm not going to lie. I thought they would completely drop into oblivion this season. Not relegation, but, you know. Me too. Me too. I thought, yeah. But they're, they're, proving, they're proving themselves very tricky to play against. And mm. they were unlucky in their match on the weekend. They were very unlucky. Jesse Lingard's screamer. Um, mm. And obviously. I mean, you guys watched the match. I mean, did West Ham probably deserve to get something out of that? Um. Look, I, I, I still think I still think United probably edged them overall, but equally, I thought that had West Ham got an equaliser, it wouldn't have been the biggest highway robbery in history, if you know what I mean. So, yeah, probably the right result in the end, but that reality is, as you know, it's not always about who plays better. You do need a bit of luck at times, and they got it in bucket loads yet again. No, absolutely, man. 100%. Yeah, go on, Scott. 100%. Were you going to add something, oh, Scott? Or? No, I was just going to address to Claire's question. Yeah, I was going to say this is a, yeah. this is a nice comment, man. I, I think address um, it. It, it. It's interesting because to me, if Patrick Vieira gets that Crystal Palace team into the top half and finishes there this season, say he finished, you know, a respectable ninth, and Arteta was to finish, say, eighth again, mm. then I think Vieira could make a case to say, look what I've done with this squad. 
Look what I've done with this squad. And he had ma- he had managed before. Patrick yeah. Vieira's managed in America. He's managed in France. Yeah. Um, so he has the advantage over Arteta um, in terms of experience. So if, if Arsenal made the decision tomorrow to get rid of Arteta and put in Patrick Vieira, I wouldn't lose a wink of sleep. I, I would not lose a wink of sleep. I'd like to avoid going down the club legend path because, to me, yeah, yeah. Arteta's not a club legend. He, he was a yeah. good player, gave his best. But Thierry Henry, Patrick Vieira, they're both club legends. Like, I, I don't want really to go down that path. I don't want Why? to. It always works because, because that, that. that's when it becomes sentimental. Like you, you forget yeah. everything yeah. about reality. Yeah, I, I don't want to see you know the day that Thierry Henry gets sacked by Arsenal. I can only imagine mm. that sacking your club legend would be would leave just a bitter taste in the mouth, and it's not something that I would like to see. No, for sure, for sure, man. But it is a it is a very very interesting one in regards to Patrick Vieira because. We'll see how he goes with Crystal Palace. Yeah. I know really good victory against um, Spurs. They've shown that they can run and whatnot, and they have some sort of an ideology under Patrick Vieira, but I feel like they do need a bit more because when it it's comes early to days. The, yeah, it's early days, but you know, they've been they, they've been put away by us, they've been put away by Liverpool. Um, I think they've been put away by Oh, I think West Ham. They they did come True back. To all. Yeah, let's see what happens. I know the bigger boys are, might be a bit too difficult for them. We'll see what happens. But it is an interesting mm. one, Scott, because I feel like he will he will get a little bit more respect, a lot more respect than what Arteta is sort of getting at the moment. I think hundred uh, percent, and he's got legend status. Yeah, he's and, and a and legend. One, and the the difference I see with Patrick Vieira and Lampard is the key one that you said. Vieira is actually managed many other clubs before this and has had proper stints um whereas frank really had the one season at derby and then just boom uh straight, straight into the hot seat, seat. <laughs> straight in, the, into the, hot in, seat. in the very stable hot seat that's Chelsea, <laughs> yeah. but, so vera yeah. would have another this season in the premier league so it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, yeah to very. watch that space ladies and gentlemen that brings us to the end of this conversation where you know we're basically talking about how managers need to be you know, the centerpiece of the club uh, and, and be able to be the key cog uh, when matters become tough to get them out of situations. As we've already mentioned, please, if you've missed it, if you just joined, we talked about Thomas Tuchel and how he was instrumental against Villa, taking out Saul, bringing in Jorginho, taking full control. Uh, yesterday, obviously, taking out Mason Mount, bringing in Kante. And I know he, you guys, that obviously it is Kante, but you still need to execute the plan. And we did that to the T, and then, uh, yeah, it's brilliant, brilliant, brilliant uh, effort from you know Tom Stuckel to be able to do that, and not just Tom Stuckel, there are a few other managers that we've talked about as well. Um, do go back and check that out, ladies and gentlemen. We've got over 100 people. It would be amazing to get 100 likes. We're literally about 33 away. We can do this uh, before we finish things off. Let's get the likes up to close to 100 if we can. If we can reach 100, it will be amazing. Check out the boys and their socials. I'll just quickly show you guys this again because I think this is quite effective. This is obviously the stream that's going on. If you scroll down uh, in the description area, the boys and their YouTube channel, it's a football thing podcast. The link is there. Once you click the link, it takes you to their page. Uh, It's a football thing podcast. Um, Literally, guys, can you let me know how many? uh, 14 to go, guys. We've got 100 here. It's a click of a button. Let's make it happen. You guys are legends. And smash that like button because we love your participation. There you go, guys. You've heard it from RJ, honestly. Uh, I can't really add much to that. And, yeah, let's help the boys out to get 400 subscribers ASAP. Hope you guys really enjoyed this. If you're here for the first time on my channel as well, Please smash the like button. Obviously, this is a collaboration between uh, the other side of the coin and down on the, uh, sorry, not down on the football crew. Uh, down on the football crew is obviously the name of the show. But yeah, collaboration between uh, the other side of the coin and it's a football thing podcast. Uh, but yeah, if you're here for the first time on this particular channel, please sm- um, smash the like button and subscribe as well. We're trying to get to uh, 8,000 subscribers as, as soon as possible. I'm about 350 away. So let's do that. We can do that. Um, Hope you guys have enjoyed this. Until next time, see ya.